Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Flow Show. More fun and games today, no doubt. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Morning, Stel. How you doing, mate? Morning, fun and inflated games. <laughs> fun and inflated games. Yeah, uh, how are you? I'm all good, mate. Who said it? Eh? Who said inflation was coming down in uh, the UK? Well, it is coming down, but not as fast as hoped. But yeah, let's not talk all about it. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not all of it. Um, yeah, Kay's uh, probably on a boat somewhere or a train or wherever he's getting swimming, pedlo, rowboat, wherever he's going back to Belgium. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, can, he can watch the. Oh, maybe he's watching a show as he's sailing along in his little dinghy. Uh, with the wife rowing, we'll see. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, so just just me and the big man Stelios in the hot seats today, and uh, we shall get right into it. Um, yeah, Mike, I'm gonna. Don't you worry about that, Bailey. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be pulling him up about that in a little bit. Um, right, kicking off in China and the PBOC. Um, they set their midpoint at 7.0560, so another big jump there. Um, yesterday it was 7.0326, um, and that was a big chunk up uh, from 7.01 something on Monday. So they're still giving the green light here. Uh, they're moving their uh, midpoint up. Uh, they're fixing rate, if you like, um, higher and higher, i.e. chasing the moves higher. Um, and that's giving the market uh, all the reason to keep going. We have made a, a new high. Um, that's what I was looking for, um, that we broke this prior high and we did so overnight. Not by much, um, you know, 70, 80 pips, but it's enough that uh, shows that whoever was selling here wasn't strong enough to keep it there and uh, the buyers are happy to push through. Uh, for me, the reason that's important is it keeps the trend going. If we'd have got a, a bit of a double top here, that might have suggested a, a steeper pullback. Um, so what we're looking at is a series of higher highs. And now I'm going to be watching for a series of higher lows and that will keep the trend in play. Um, it gives me a bit more confidence to uh, get add back into some longs if we get down to this area here, down to 703s, 702s. Um, that would be a, where I'll be looking to see the trend keeping uh, its momentum going. It will be making a higher low off of that. Um, it's a bit of a break point. If it's a fine support there, fine, keeps the trend in play, add to longs and see if we get a push up above that high once again. Or conversely, it keeps going and uh, this area becomes the low and off we go again. But uh, we shall see. The, the faster it goes up, the greater the chance of officials coming out and uh, jawboning it a bit stronger than they have done. Um, over to the good old Kiwi, because um, they hiked rates uh, by 25 pips overnight to five and a half. Where's my Kiwi chart gone? Have I lost it? Oh, there it is there. Um, and pretty much uh, suggested that they're going on pause and that it was a, a tighter decision between a 25 and a pause um, at this meeting. So their cash rate now, 5.5%. Um, they see it peaking there at 5.5% and, and rate cuts starting from Q3 2024. Um, they say global growth remains weak, but inflation pressures are easing. Um, RBNZ or Governor Orr said the latest data is pleasing after a long battle. Um, and therefore shadowing, keeping a restrictive monetary policy for some time. And that it was a difficult decision whether to pause or hike. Um, so a bigger reaction to the downside, um, as mentioned, because expectations were for either 25 or 50. Um, so the fact that it was the decision was a, a 25 or a pause is not as hawkish. Um, so we have seen a big reaction south in the Kiwi. Uh, it's been a, been a bit of a push on the open door because, you know, it was looking weak, as mentioned yesterday, going into the data or going into the announcement. Um, so the fact that uh, the announcement came out uh, less hawkish just uh, made it an easy path to see further downside. Um, so it's got down, didn't quite get as low as it did in April, the Kiwi. Um, need to keep an eye on that low now because it might be running out of puff at the moment and we're switching over 
to uh, what's going on in the rest of the world and in the dollar yields and everything else. Um, so that low, though, this low area around the six low 61s is where you want to be watching for now. Um, if we find a bit of a bottom there, that might suggest that this move um, is going to say run out of puff down here. Maybe we'll get a bit of a bounce, um, but it is going to be based now on what's uh, happening elsewhere. Um, RBA's Jacobs uh, came out saying the balance sheet is starting to unwind uh, on the pandemic bond purchases. So a bit of QT going on in Australia. It did list out some numbers and stuff, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's overly big uh, for the market at the moment. Everyone's doing QT. Um, ECB's Nagel said several more rate hikes are needed to tame inflation. Um, German hawks being hawkish over there. I'm um, just going to look at the data and uh, let's get the right pages up first. Boom and boom. So we'll come back to some of yesterday's numbers. Um, we got uh, some PPI data from Canada and the falls not as big as expected. It was expected to fall 5.6% year on year. Um, but it only fell 3.5%, still a bigger move than last month. Um, on the raw materials, um, again, it was expecting a bigger fall uh, and it didn't happen, down 10.8%. Um, so these PPI numbers, you'll notice, are all in the negative, um, except for that month for month number there. Um, but pretty much all in the negative. So this is going to be dragging on inflation further down the line. There is always a lag between PPI and CPI. Um, you could call it a bit sticky as it's not falling as much as expected, but the fact it's coming down um, still means that inflation should be moving in the right direction. And um, coming over to the US um, and we got some uh, housing data and obviously that S&P uh, PMI, um, the manufacturing data fell into contraction. Um, again, that divergence, because as you can see from services, it had a healthy jump from 53.6 to 55.1. Um, so mixed numbers there on, on the sector front, but services are one of the biggest sectors these days. So that's had the, the better influence. So the market largely went with that number over the manufacturing number. Um, home sales coming in, came in as a, uh, it beat expectations. It matched the prior number, which was 683, but that prior number got revised down to 656. Um, now, what was um, the, the standout from that is that house prices were down on last year. So potentially we may be seeing a turn in house prices uh, in the US. It's not been a straight line. Uh, some of the numbers have shown similar. Some have uh, still shown gains. Um, but year on year, these new home sales prices uh, potentially coming down there. Um, Fed's Kashkari was out. He's uh, he's not shy this week. Um, if inflation stays high, we may need to keep rates higher. Um, and on the debt ceiling rubbish, um, loads of comments, as you can imagine. I've tried to just pick out the uh, pertinent ones, and these are all in timeline order, so you can you get a sense of how Things have gone over the last sort of uh, 12, 24 hours. Um, so the Republican negotiator Graves or Graves said uh, that Republicans in the White House are still far apart on the debt ceiling deal after Monday night's talks. Uh, wow, we've on, never heard this before. Seriously, this is brand new that. information. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm wearing uh, my, my sarcastic hat today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, now, now you're going to hear how things different, uh, are different as, as the hours progress and how it's still a bit of a mess. Um, so House Speaker McCarthy, um, not long after that, said we are nowhere near a deal yet. Um, apparently told got lawmakers a deal is not close yet, but said we could still finish this by uh, June the 1st. And then a US Republican, uh, Hearn, came out and said McCarthy told Republicans that we're closer every day on a debt ceiling deal and have got to get there. So... <laughs> One minute, a deal's not close, <laughs> and the next minute, a deal's getting closer. Um, the White House came out with a statement saying Biden and McCarthy had a productive meeting on Monday, and both reiterated that default is off the table. Um, so 
this is what I'm picking up now. Okay, we're in a situation where we, we're likely to be heading towards a deal. Uh, first and foremost, it's sounding as we sit here right now, it's sounding like um, a debt uh, default is pretty much off the table or as near as can be going to be off the table. Um, I think things will have to turn really sour really quickly for that to come back on. Never say never. Um, but both sides are, are trying to talk down that uh, they'll actually see a default. So that's a bit of a positive for the market to hang on to. Um, I think you know there's probably lots of uh, lots more red lines and things they need to to cross over and negotiate. Uh, as I sit here now, I, I'd say it was probably seventy thirty that we don't get a default. Um, but that really, yeah, seventy thirty. I would say ninety five five. Ninety. Yeah. That's a chance okay. of default. I would say less than five percent. Yeah, I get it, and I. <laughs> It's all it's all on the clock. The, the the closer we get towards that deadline, I think then obviously the the odds of it happening potentially increase. Um, but but what do you mean by what do we mean by default? So the the US actually not paying interest? Or no, I mean principal... well, what, 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 well, okay, let's not call it default. Let's call it um, ah, okay, okay, you know, running out of money. Okay, um, that that is more likely, yes, but yeah. not paying oh, yeah. for not... treasuries, no way. Oh no no no, no that's a, that's a hundred percent. Because even if even if they hit hit the debt limit, even if they run out of money, um, that's what I'm really talking about running out of money, and and when the government starts shutting down. Um, oh, okay, that is, I, I agree that with is, you. Not agree. not the default. Once you make myself clear, not the default. Okay. Because what they'll do if they run out of money, they will enact further emergency measures, and paying off debt will go top of the list. Um, yeah, they'll prioritize exactly. Yeah, exactly. People won't be able to get their welfare checks. People will go starving and hungry, but they'll pay their debt. That's that's what will happen. Um, so, yeah, let me I'll rephrase that. So running out of cash um, is 70, 30 uh, in my in my mind. Um, and yeah, I think that that changes the, the longer this goes and the market will get more antsy the longer this goes towards the deadline um, without a resolution. Um, but yeah, we'll, there will not be a default uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and it's just a question of then what what sort of can kick do we get? Um, you know, there's really three options. We get a short term can kick, and then we go through this all over again in 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 three months after the summer. Um, we get a deal agreed, and it's all signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, right now, that's the most positive outcome. Um, and in the middle of that, we get a deal agreed but they kick the can for this three months while they go over the, call it the contracts and the, the signing, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, but the market will obviously be happy with either of those two uh, latter outcomes. Um, anything that's a short-term can kick and we're back in this situation in three months, I think will be seen negatively, um, as we've been saying for quite a while. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the waffle of my thoughts on, on where we are. Uh, on the debt stuff, do you? Do you uh, well, you just said you you got similar yeah. thoughts yourself, still. Yeah, I think the um, the fact that um, uh, was it Biden who said that uh, a default is out of the question or something like that. Um, yeah, both, that both for me. Them, yeah. yeah, but that for me tells me everything I need to know because uh, if they don't default, it means they need to keep making payments uh, naturally. Uh, and with a trillion plus deficit every year, how do they fund these payments? You know, they might mint a trillion, quadrillion uh, dollar coin. That's one way. But the other way is to raise the debt ceiling. And that's what they're going to do. So for me, um, I still think there's absolutely no way they're going to default on debt. Uh, could there be a government shutdown? Of course they could. There was, it happened 10 years ago. It could happen again. We've all seen that this is not positive in any way for the government or the country or anybody. Uh, the only reason why they're doing all these shenanigans is because they're obviously negotiating what they want for their people, each side. And that's how politicians know how to operate. And that's how they've always operated. So they're jockeying for position, trying to get the, the stuff they each want. And then they're going to announce that the debt ceiling is raised. Um, 
so for for me, for what I think the markets are going to do, uh, in particular, what I think the dollar is going to do, and of course, we're going to talk about markets in a bit, but just as I have this train of thought, I just want to complete it. Uh, if there is uh, um, less than 5% chance, in my opinion, any kind of proper default, the absolutely whacked. I think uh, rates go up quite fast um, and the dollar gets smashed. Um, if there is no default and they raise the debt ceiling, I think a very short-term reaction, the dollar probably gets bid because of this, um, pardon me saying it, but silly thing uh, whereby uh, raising the debt ceiling means that there's less liquidity in the market, of course, in the short term. But think about it. It's like me oh, having a $10,000 limit on my credit card and then suddenly having a $100,000 limit uh, in my credit card and spending more. Yes, the short term um, reaction is one way, but really the in, in terms of fundamentals, I'm worse off than I was before. So that's what I think will happen. And I think that or when they raise the debt ceiling, the dollar gets bid and it's going to give us one hell of a great opportunity to to really get short the dollar um, when that happens after you know, a few days, few weeks. I don't know how it's going to be. But anyway, that's my view. I think the dollar medium term is going a lot lower. There's absolutely no way around that. And um, I'm not saying that the dollar is going to be replaced by the yuan or anything else. No, but I think the dollar is going to be weaker, you know, a year or two from now. But um, I know a lot of people are day traders and they don't give a toss about what I say because it doesn't apply to them. So I apologize. <laughs> no need to apologize, mate, because it's it's always good to know the bias. Even if you're even if you're a day trader, you know, short term trader, you need to know which way the wind's blowing because. Uh, that tells you how strong or weak uh, a currency may move in any one direction. Um, so it's all helpful info, info mate. It all goes into the pot, certainly, uh, from what I take from trading. Um, right, in other geopolitical talk, um, White House Press Secretary said that uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo uh, and his Chinese counterparts are to have an important talk um, this is about, obviously, uh, relations turning a bit sour. Um, in the recent comments, uh, China's been coming out saying that uh, relationship is suffering and needs to get back on track, so on and so forth. Um, so we've been leading up to some talks uh, with the various different, uh, let's call them government uh, levels. Um, so they're going to have an important talk, apparently. But while China has been uh, spouting off about how they need to get relations back on track with the US, uh, Premier Li um, had a meeting with a Russian prime minister in Beijing and said pragmatic cooperation between China and Russia has shown a good development trend. China is willing to work with Russia to promote pragmatic cooperation in various fields and take it to a new level. So talking out of both sides of their mouth there. Um, and just keeping everyone aware that they are on the side of Russia at the moment, uh, especially given everything that's going on in the Ukraine. Um, right, coming over to today's data, and the big one really was the CPI data from the UK. Um, now, coming into the data yesterday, you remember we had Bailey speaking. Um, he said, we must not try to fight inflation with very severe increases in rates. Um, and he said, we are nearer to the peak on interest rates. And then uh, before that, his first line was that inflation has turned the corner. And we all wondered whether he was giving us a bit of a nod. Well, inflation was expected to drop to 8.3% or 8.2%, depending on what calendars you're looking at. Um, it came in hotter than that at 8.7%. So it did drop but not as much uh, as many were expecting. However, you have a look at the core number, and that went up to 6.8% from 62 expected and prior. That's a fairly hefty jump for the core number. Um, that's the one they will be looking at. Uh, so that number alone has probably sealed the deal for a hike in June, another hike in June, and I suspect... Uh, maybe one or two more after that, depending on what this number does hereafter. Now, the only saving grace for the BOE um, is the PPI numbers. Um, as you can see there, the core PPI output number. So this is prices uh, coming out of uh, manufacturers, factories, services, whatever. Um, that did drop quite chunky to 6% from 8.3%. 
also the RPI, core RPI, so this is retail pricing, again, another significant drop. The main PPI numbers, input prices, so this is what f factories are paying for their uh, materials, etc. So this is costs for manufacturers, 3.9%. So a real big drop there from 7.3 prior and 7% expected. Output prices as well. So this is what firms will charge for their products that they make. So that came down to 5.4% from 8.5%. So another big drop there. So on one hand, you've got a sticky CPI data. On the other hand, you've got PPI data, which are, is showing significant falls. Um, but remember, these are all still gains. There's no negative numbers here. This is just prices going up, just not as fast. So there is still inflation there from these numbers, but the direction they're going in now is looking a bit better for the Bank of England. And this will feed through to CPI um, over the months ahead. Again, doesn't mean we'll start seeing negative numbers. It just means the rate of inflation will start dropping a bit as well. So there's something for everyone there. Um, as I say, I think we've cemented a hike just purely on those core numbers. Um, as I mentioned and have been mentioning for months, I expect CPI to be far more sticky than people expect. Uh, and that's uh, definitely shown up in, in this number, at least. Um, for the pound, it's, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, the pound got sold, uh, oh, sorry, pound got bought initially um, based on that heavy core number, because as I say, the market has now ramped up expectations for the BOE. Um, we are now apparently pricing in 5.5% uh, peak an 80% chance of a 5.5% peak, um, but rates get into 5.25 by the end of this year. Uh, they were hovering around the 5% mark uh, previously, so those have been ramped up. So we did get a, a pop in the pound, uh, cable being one of them, um, but it wasn't, it didn't hold. Um, and I think that was due to those PPI numbers, um, suggesting, as I say, that inflation is likely to uh, come back down over the months ahead. Um, same for Euro sterling. This one I was looking at, are we going to break through this zone? Um, we definitely broke that uh, support that we were hovering around previously. But again, it couldn't hold it and it couldn't get all the way through. And we're back above and looking like we might have another challenge on uh, the, the recent highs, 87s, 87.20s. Um, so the market, as I say, taking those numbers uh on its chest and uh, now we're back to doing what we were doing before all those data pieces dropped. Um, what do you make uh, from all that Stelios? I think you're absolutely right in uh, what you said. Um, CPI is dropping. I mean, uh, they said that it's turned the corner. Bailey said it's turned the corner. Well, it actually has, right? We dropped 1.4% or what was it? Instead of 1.7, I have to look at the numbers again. I can't remember. But, you know, yeah. it is dropping. And what is more important, like you said, PPI uh, input number is lower. So that means that going forward, theoretically, the price of goods should be increasing at a lower rate. Is that good? Of course not, because they're still increasing bloody hell, you know, way above 2%, but um, this yeah. is probably going to bring downward pressures. And we need to remember that every month that goes forward, we're removing a month of high inflation and we're adding a month of low inflation. So this rate of drop um, of inflation, sorry, this direction is going to keep going. The worrying thing is that core is sticky. And I, I think you're absolutely right in, in pointing that out. And that's going to, I think, uh, drive the Bank of England to keep hiking. Um, I think because inflation is stickier in the, U the UK, I think the, the pound this year is going to probably do better than the other majors, and it's already doing pretty well. Um, so my view hasn't changed on that, but I think that the Bank of England, after you know hiking one, maybe two more times, I think they're going to be pausing because at the end of the day, they all follow the Fed. And uh, if the Fed's pausing, it's going to be difficult for others to keep going for a long time. Um, so I think this is the main kind of macro uh, theme now is pausing everywhere. Uh, and we saw the RBNZ doing 25. It was between 25 and 50. They're going to keep erring on the side of caution and see, you know, pause and see how inflation evolves. Because let's face it, the, the trajectory is still lower. So they're going to use that as an excuse 
to say, okay, let's see how that uh, evolves. Uh, do I think it's right? I think they should probably, well, they should have done a lot more a lot sooner, but uh, at this point in time, it's not an unreasonable thing to expect from central banks. Um, but yeah, so to, to summarize the UK inflation, it is stickier, but the trajectory is still down. And uh, as we move forward, it's going to keep moving lower. And I think, do I think it's going to get to 2%? No, but I really do think that we're going to find the bottom somewhere around, I know it sounds a bit extreme, but somewhere, somewhere between 3 and 4%. That's what I think we're going to find the bottom, which is still a problem. <laughs> That's the yeah. thing. It's still a problem for the UK, for the Fed, for everybody. Um, but yeah, uh, that's you know that's my take on it. Yeah, for, for the UK, I'd, I'd set mine around more, probably four to six percent mark for inflation. It's it's all it's always going to be higher in the UK. It's just the, the nature of the beast. Um, yeah. But you know, if, let's say the 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 Bank of England have got. I still think they're getting to five percent. So I'm going to say they've they've still got uh, two more hikes in the pipe. That'll put them on five percent. Um, if the Fed, let's say realistically, they might have one more in the pipe, maybe two. So let's call it five and a half percent might be their peak. The ECB, what do you think? Two, two more in the pipe for them, or will two, they get to four percent? Yeah, two more probably. Yeah. Two more. Okay. Well, let's let's be a bit conservative and say they get to four percent. So you're going to have the Fed, you're going to have the Bank of England on five percent, the Fed on five and a half, the ECB on four percent. From that point, if that's if that's the peak in rates from these guys, then the market is going to be wanting to park its money, or some of the market, some investors are going to want to park their money where the higher rates are. Um, so, so that's Turkey. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's indeed. You can hop across the border, mate. Do some shopping. Um, <laughs> so you know, the Fed's obviously going to be top of the pile. The UK will be higher than than the ECB by a whole percentage point potentially. So that's going to be a bit of a, a boon um, for investors. You know, so that's going to be supportive of the pound, um, and that could be at the cost of the eurozone. Because from there, rates are only likely to come down unless uh, obviously inflation has another surge or economies start really heating up again, wages keep going, etc. So really, it's all going to be downhill from there. So there's going to be investors and money that are going to want to lock in in, in the long term for some of those rates. Um, so they'll be getting in, you know, five, tens, twenties, that sort of area, those sort of durations where they can lock in for five and a half percent because rates might come down to a neutral rate to two and a half, three percent, um, you know, and just a couple of percent, percent and a half for, you know, when you're talking about billions and trillions of, of pounds, dollars, whatever, that's a big chunk, even just taking a half a percent yield when these guys are happy to take, you know, tenths of a, a pip of a percentage point uh, for yield differentials. So, that's going to be where we're going to see a lot of the currency moves coming in, a lot of the trends coming in. Again, a lot of the cross plays because then you factor in all the other central banks and where they'll be, RBNZ, RBA to lesser extents. Um, but that's, you know, we're talking probably three, four, six months down the line when that happens. But it's important to know what's coming up over this period because that's going to drive the trends. And, Pete, you know, if you're, if you're a pound bull, um, you know, and you see a rally and the Bank of England gets its rates to its peak, you know, you've got to think, well, maybe that's when the turn's going to happen. And uh, those turns, if you can catch them, are the big ones. They're the big trends where you can get in and you can ride it for five, 600 pips, even more sometimes. So I hope that helps, um, you know, particularly what we do on the show here, just giving you that fundamental insight. I know it's a long way away, um, but that's how I trade long term. And if I can catch those turns, that's what makes me the big bucks. Uh, so I hope you guys and girls can get in on that too. Um, just, to, uh, just to finish off, there was another bit of data. Um, although, have they changed it? Yes, they've changed it. So uh, Reuters copped up the numbers earlier. They had uh, expectations and the current assessment round the wrong way. Uh, they've now adjusted those and corrected those back. Um, but the IFO business news, business climate uh, came in a bit softer than expected, although current conditions was a bit uh, better than expected, but still down. And expectations took a bit of a bashing as well. Um, 
and the IFO said that uh, rate hikes from the ECB have uh, dented demand. Uh, exports are looking a bit soggy, um, and uh, they're expecting uh, stagflation to kick in from Q2. So not so much good news coming in over there. Right, just to keep you up to speed as well, Bailey is uh, currently speaking at the moment. I don't know if he's finished. He was speaking at uh, some climate rubbish. So I doubt we've I've not seen any comments uh, worth noting from him. But he's speaking again at two o'clock to uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, so that's going to be probably going to be uh, talking about the inflation today uh, as well. So we may get a little bit of insight there and what... Uh, they may do with rates based on the numbers we saw this morning. So that's uh, 2 p.m. UK time. So mark that on your calendars, wherever you may be. Um, just before we move on, Mike says, how much of the UK inflation is imported? Tons of it. I don't know the percentage wise, um, but we're a, we're a huge energy importer and obviously that's priced uh, in dollars. Um, so that can be offset somewhat if, uh, the exchange rate moves obviously favourably. So if prices are going up, we pay more dollars. Or if the rate's going up, then that's offset somewhat. Um, but a lot of our inflation is imported, food, energy particularly. Um, so while prices stay elevated there, and that was one of the things in the CPI data, that, that food prices are still at multi-year highs and are showing no signs of uh, coming down just yet. So that and wages, and as we mentioned before, strikes and stuff keeps a lot of inflation potentially in the pipe. Why it's going to be sticky uh, moving forward. Um, but anyway, enough of that for today. Um, so coming back and looking at prices, uh, as I said, euro sterling had that break, didn't hold. We're back above. We could put in a move towards these highs. I, if we're not going to move down on those numbers, or I, the pound's not going to strengthen on the potential for the Bank of England uh, may be turning a bit more hawkish than they have been, um, then this could get up above breakthrough 87.20. Um, I'm already still long uh, my core position. I had my stop on the lot at 88.40, so that uh, survived by a few pips. Um, I may look to play a short-term break if through 20s um, if that happens, just for a, a quick scalp, see if we get a, a little run-up to maybe... Uh, 87, 50, 60 is in this zone up here, um, just for a little scalp, uh, because something, to me, something's got to give here. Uh, we had a crack, couldn't hold it. So if we ain't going down, there's only other one way to go, and that's up. Conversely, if we get a move back down here and we find this area holding around 86, 70, that'll give me a, maybe a bit of conviction to try a, a trade off of here. Again, a bit of a short term one and uh, see if, if we can play the ping pong game between there and 87.20. Uh, for the good old cable, um, nothing really of note there. It, it had to say, it had to move up, it's had to move down. Um, hasn't quite got down to these prior lows uh, that we saw yesterday. Um, so that's a bit of a marker there. It is a bit of a prior um, support point. We've seen that before. Um, there may be uh, some of you watching for a bit of a head and shoulders developing. Not my bag, but good luck to you. Um, the big support level is still down here towards these fibs um, and the low 123s into 123. So if this move does continue, uh, keep an eye on there. But I think we're probably, again, switching to watching what's going on in the dollar uh, and yields and stuff. Um, I know Stel's going to talk about yields, so I won't uh, touch on those uh, too uh, for too long, um, I keep an eye on this two year, as you well know, um, this 4.2627 give or take is holding. Um, so while we do that, it suggests that further upside is in play and pairs like dollar yen um, and the dollar will follow that. Uh, so as always, keep an eye on yields. Um, I did get a question from one of our roomies um, about whether tens can get back up towards that 3.9 area. Um, I think it's possible based on the volatility um you know over the space of a couple of days it's quite easy to do 20 20 pips in this one um fundamentally i don't think so um because where what the data is showing right now is that yeah things are okay um nothing great nothing horrific um i think only if we get a real strong uh, turn in the economy i.e better real better numbers 
um, will yields get back up there. The only other way I think yields will get back up to those sort of levels is if we do hit, uh, if we do run out of cash and um, we hit the, the deadline without a resolution, then investors are going to demand a premium for buying US debt. Premium means higher yields, uh, much like we saw in the one month yields, uh, which had that big jump up at that auction. Um, because investors said, you want me to lend you uh, money for a month while well, you might uh, be defaulting, you're going to pay a price for it. Um, so that's another reason why yields might go back up towards the, the, the 4% mark, call it. But just based purely on the fundamentals, I can't see us getting there on that. Um, and the still says, you know, if you're going to be getting a weaker dollar, yields are likely to be coming down as well. Um, the only other one I want to look at quickly um, is Aussie dollar because um, that finally made the break of 66. Um, we have run into a bit of trouble against these old March lows for now. We're holding that sort of area, um, but we've broken under the 66 handle level I was looking at. Uh, and I did take uh, a little bit off my short just before bed last night at 66.10. Um, and I've done a bit more at 72 down here. We've got this big zone coming up. Um, I've been highlighting for quite some time, big support zone. Let's get it up there. So this blue area down here, it really starts from the FIB at around 65.47 down to 65.20s, call it. Um, and then you can probably extend that down to the big figure. Um, now, I was looking at this area for potential long, um, but the fact I'm short now, I'm in two minds. I don't know whether to get off all my short down into this area um, and turn it long or keep the short and just try a bit of a small scalp off this area just to see if it, if it bounces some um, and play both sides of the coin here. Because I, I see no reason for now why the trend should change in this one. And the trend over the last few days has been uh, steadily down. But I expect us to find a bit of trouble into here. Um, I don't expect us to carve through it straight away unless there's some some big news uh, for either the dollar or the Aussie. Um, so if you're not in a position, that's somewhere to keep an eye on, uh, maybe for a long try into that zone. Still, I hope you've got your Ryan. chance. Ryan, mate. Yes, I will uh, show the, some uh, things and uh, chop the pattern. One, there got it. Go. All righty. So um, as the debt ceiling looms, uh, we're kind of on a holding pattern. There are some moves happening, uh, some um, instruments kind of trying to break out or break down. So it is interesting, but um, I think it's still going to be a bit of a... Um, uh, choppy, broadly sideways uh, direction until we have uh, clarity on what happened, or, or should I say, until the debt ceiling is raised. Um, so yields. Well, the 10-year actually broke above that 363 high. What, what was that? So theoretically, as long as this holds, we're heading towards um, the top end of this uh, resistance trend line. I know it's only two touches, so it's not that... Um, um, strong, but um, perhaps conference of this FIB and this uh, trend line L390 uh, could be the next target. I mean, if you ask me, I would probably say that uh, I want to be long yields as long as we're above that breakout point. Um, and it's it was seven sessions in a row, pretty strong ones as well. Um, so yields looking firm at the moment. Um, uh, what so that's with that done with uh, we go to the dollar and the dollar is kind of similar because let's face it the dollar and um, uh, treasury yields are correlated uh, not a perfect correlation but uh, you know as the dollar rises uh, that usually means that rate expectations are going higher for the US compared to other countries so the um, uh, you know yields are also rising with it um, so the dollar bounced off these lows. I mean, we really tested those. We've tested them uh, four or five times now. Um, and this move has been pretty uh, strong. I do think that we're going to probably continue. Um, do I think we're going to get to those 105.90 highs? I don't think so. But, um, at, you know, it could be when the debt ceiling gets resolved and, and pushed, pushed higher, 
Um, I think the knee-jerk reaction is going to be to buy the dollar, and I think we should be waiting for that move uh, to kind of uh, materialize and, and complete before we sell into it. Um, so my view is dollar bounces up towards perhaps 105, 104 and a half, 105, and then uh, it's the long journey south. We break below the lows, and then who knows where we go. Um, and now I'm going to be looking at specific pairs to short, um, dollar pairs to short. The euro dollar um, might be one of them to get long. Uh, it depends on where we go. If we get near that 105.20 or 105, whatever low it is, I think that's definitely worth a shot. But you guys know, guys and girls know that my favorite is the dollar Norway, which has broken out. I'm not touching it now. Remember, I tried the short here, 1081, was it? Uh, it worked for a little while, and then I, I brought my stops to break even because I thought, look, if it comes back and retests this, it's probably going to break. Um, so I got taken out at flat, and it's just gone straight through, um, which goes to show um, that uh, you know you need to be disciplined. You need to have your levels and really try to avoid moving your stops. It is a a, a big um, – how do you say it? Um, I know the Greek word. I've forgotten the English word now. Huh. Anyway, it's uh, it's tempting. It's a temptation, but um, you really shouldn't. Um, so the dollar Norway, I'm looking at, you know, these highs at 11, we're almost there. So I think um, these are going to get taken out probably. If the dollar rallies, which I think it will uh, on a dead ceiling resolution, I think they're going to get taken out. So the only other level we have is that 12, 11 all-time high, which I doubt we're going to get there. But... Um, uh, this is definitely a pair I'm looking at and waiting and waiting for that. The other one is a dollar CAD, um, where I'm going to be waiting for a, a break below this. I know we're 200 base points above, so I don't care. But once that breaks, I think there's a lot of room below. Uh, I am definitely going to try and play a short um, if we get to the or when we get to this uh, resistance trend line. But again, you know, this is another pair where I'm not at any level that I like yet, so I'm going to be waiting for that um i do i do wait a lot i do tend to wait a lot i know i'm not a day trader but i like to um let things get to my levels um cable is interesting uh it really is wavering now you know this this kind of breakout that we had has been going sideways and it is uh not uh not looking great <laughs> So I don't know what to do with cable. I really think I want to be a buyer on dips of, of sterling in general, but um, with a potential rally in the dollar coming with a dead ceiling resolution, I I wouldn't I wouldn't pull the trigger just yet. Um, where do I pull the trigger? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Get rid of this. Oops. What did I get rid of? Uh, let's see. This here. If this was a high. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Is the answer? I need more price action. Um, the euro pound. As long as we're below these um, eighty-seven two, the breakdown level, we're close, and um, we're not breaking down as convincingly as I thought we would. But as long as we're below that, I'm still bearish. And um, you could say that this kind of like two-week action is bearish consolidation. Could be. No, this uh, a pretty impulsive move, then we're sideways, we could continue. Um, it will depend on the Bank of England, it will depend on a lot of things, but I do think that the Bank of England probably has a little bit more uh, of hikes to do, definitely definitely than the Fed and perhaps than the ECB as well. So I am still constructive on the pound for the remainder of the year, but obviously the uh, things can change as economic data gets released. Um, Metals, uh, gold has bounced from this fib and this uh, support it used to be resistance up here. It's uh, support now. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, but I still think that the next move for metals is still lower. Um, you know, where can we get? I, I, I think that gold could 
I know it might sound a little bit aggressive, but we could go another hundred bucks below, you know, towards this 1850 level. Uh, but uh, it will depend on the dollar and the market's knee-jerk reactions, which are completely irrational, but they happen. And this is what we have to work with. So if the debt ceiling gets, or when the debt ceiling gets um, increased, which means that the uh, US will be able to borrow lots more and uh, eventually monetize a lot more, um, which means effectively printing a lot more money. Uh, that, for me, in the long run, is as bullish as it can get for metals and other real assets, uh, provided that supply and demand is unchanged. And let's face it, supply and demand for metals is unchanged. If anything, there is more demand than supply in the past few years. It's um, uh, characteristically uh, been a two-year silver deficit now. And um, that's one of, another one of the reasons why I really, really like silver. Um, but in the short term, we could get a move lower. You know, it, it, this is how markets work. And they tend to push metals very hard um, to the downside, uh, to take stops out, to do all, all sorts of stuff. Um, silver, well, we have, this is what I thought would happen. But it hasn't. So this now is opening the door for more downside, uh, potentially towards 22. Uh, I am full size long now, uh, roughly at these levels, just a, a smidge below. Um, and I'm perfectly happy. Even if we get to 22, I'm the you know decision for me will be: Do I go more than a full position long, or do I just wait? Uh, and this is exactly what happened. I know I've said this before so many times. Forgive me for repeating myself. This is exactly what happened. When I got long in um, mid 2018, <clears throat> and this happened, <laughs> we got down to 11, uh, 11, 60, 70, whatever it was, and that was the big decision. I actually wanted to get a lot longer, but I was already full size long, uh, full position size long, and I didn't. And then I got rid of it basically at around 24 and a half, 25. So that was a really good run, but I had, I had to wait a year and a half for it, and. I had to stomach this loss here. And I think this could happen again. This could play again. Um, I'm on leverage. Do we get to 22? Yeah, we could easily. And that's, a, you know, almost a 10% drawdown. I, I'm i not worried um, because I do think that the, um, the macro situation is clear uh, as can be. And... Um, I think we're going a lot higher. And if you think about it, it's perverse that silver gets smashed because inflation is high. I mean, everything's getting more expensive. Silver cannot be getting cheaper unless supply is a lot bigger than demand, which it isn't. So uh, definitely you need nerves of steel for this. I'm not recommending you do what I do, not in a million years. This is what I do. This is how I trade and uh, it's not for everybody. So I'm just describing what I'm doing. Um, platinum is a similar story. It's also retested this channel. I know probably haven't drawn it perfectly, but uh, this looks like it is also breaking down a little bit. Um, so could we get towards these lows at the low 900? Yes, we could. I think we're going to get to absolutely incredible buying levels in these metals, um, platinum and silver, a lot more than gold, because let's face it, gold has been a bloody monster. I mean, look at that, given what the Fed's done over the past and the other central banks over the past couple of years, this is... In insanely strong price action, any way you look at it. So I am not worried at all about these. Okay, so moving on to cryptos. Um, yeah, so this might not, well, was this a kind of a triangle that broken? I don't know, but if I remove this line here, impulsive move lower, consolidation. Does this look bullish? No, it doesn't. And um We've had risk selling off because we're getting closer to a potential um, government shutdown. There's no resolution. So risk gets sold, cryptos follow. It's uh, as simple as that. Um, yeah, I really wouldn't want to be long here. This definitely looks a bearish, like a bearish consolidation to me. Again, as I've said so many times, if or when there is a resolution and um, equities rally, which they do, I don't see a scenario where uh, cryptos are not going to follow. Maybe they will un underperform, yes. But if the uh, S&P is up 2%, I don't think cryptos are going to be down. Um, so that's what I'm saying. So talking about the S&Ps, uh, this was interesting. We got to the highs, just took them out, and then came right back down. So 
did we get a false breakout? It does look like it. I'm actually surprised that we didn't uh, trigger all kinds of stops up here. Maybe they're a bit above. I don't know, but um, this does look like a, does look like a false breakout. So now we're back within this range, 4,200 to, well, to 40, 45, 40, 50. So this is now still the range. <laughs> what do I think is going to happen? I still think the probabilities is will break to the upside because I still think that the, uh, the debt ceiling will be raised and all this uncertainty and fear over default are going to be taken out. So do I think we should be shorting? Uh, no, I don't think. Do I think we should be going long? No, because we're right in the middle of this range now. So um, I think it's wait and see now. Uh, if we get close to these lows, I think it's probably worth a shot uh, getting long. But personally, I will be buying when we break the highs again, because that will mean that there has been a resolution. And um, I think the trip towards 4,300 is going to be a very quick one after that. Um that's pretty much it. Uh, oil, I don't trade. I've said this before. I mean, look at these daily candles. They're absolutely horrifying for somebody like me. If you guys and gals trade oil and you're doing well, I salute you. You're much better than I am. Um, yeah, I'm leaving that. Anyway, that's it for me, uh, Mr. Ryan. I hope I was helpful, everybody. <laughs> the and, the uh, short oil analysis in the world, folks. <laughs> yeah. I hate to talk about things that I don't know what to do with, so I'm just going to leave them alone. Yeah, <laughs> best way, mate. Best way. Um, yeah. right, let's grab, uh, let's grab that back quickly. Boom and boom. Uh, see my screen, all right? Yes, sir. Gotcha, gotcha. Good, good stuff. Um, Ellie's uh, Ellie was asking about gold. Um, he's short. He's short seventy-seven. Um, Yes, fair enough. You've got a little bit of a high area here around 83, 85, just off the bounce there. Um, you know where you, where the support is coming in now. It's coming in around that uh, 1950s. Um, I was looking at getting in some shorts if we got a, another test up here, which we didn't get. Um, so that would have been a nice trade to sit on, but we can't trade backwards. Um, I, I think rallies are going to get hit again. If we get a move up here, depending on the, the driver, of course, I think gold goes lower if we get a resolution. Um, that was a basis behind my trade. Um, I think for now, like uh, Stills mentioned, with, with quite a few things, we're just like the S&P. We just we've had a big move. It's not yet broken. Um, you know, if you take this leg from November, uh, let's stick a quick fib in there if I can do it quickly. Come on, where are you? There we go. Snap and snap. Just roughly. Let's see, you can see there. So at the moment, you've got to see what work has to be done to change this trend. Um, so, you know, the first thing is getting down to the 38.2 fib. So while we're up here, we may have had a little blow off the highs, but we're potentially just sitting in no man's land. So, Ali, for your trade, I know you're trading a bit more short term. So, uh, that's uh, good for you. Um, but, you know, if you're not going to get through this 1950s, uh, then that's where you want to be looking at uh, to take profit. Um, you're targeting 61 anyway, so just above that zone, so not too bad. Um, anyway, um, on the oil front, yeah, um, again, I just don't see this as doing anything. Now, this is probably one of the longest consolidation periods we've seen in oil um, for quite some time. Um, as you can see, it's always moving. It, you know, we've had a period of since December where we're just going sideways. We, we're having a bit, we're having the odd move, but it's always coming back to this area, um, which shows a lot of indecision. This is going to be one that is going to be affected by the fundamentals. You know, things like the PMIs. We're seeing manufacturing suffering um, in a lot of countries. Um, I'm surprised oil isn't uh, a bit lower on all those. Um, obviously for the global recession fears, if you like. Um, but then, as we spoke about yesterday, we've got the, uh, we had the Saudi oil minister coming up, popping up and saying that speculators need to be careful that they might pull a rabbit out the hat and we get another bounce. Uh, if that's the case, our old 8250 level will be in play. Um, and if uh, any sort of noise like that can't bust that level, then uh, everyone should know what to do with it. Let's just have a look at that quickly into there. 
So we did get a bit similar to the S&Ps. We had a big level 42s or here and all. We had a big one, a 250. It stuck its nose above and then wallop all the way back down again. So that's your key area still for the top side. Unless we get out of this area and hold, uh, we've had a couple of tries, but we've had the moves down, but they've come back. So unless we get a real solid hold under this sort of 70, 72 area, um, and it stays there for a while, then only then will we get further downside. But as I say, to get the upside, we need to get above this 82.50. But, you know, there's eight bucks for you to play with in that area, if you so wish. Um, yeah, the S&Ps, interesting what you say, because I think still, I think it might have tried to do a little bit of a shakeout up the top there, get a few buyers hooked in on that 42 break. And yep. uh then spit them out again. Um, but I think you're right. I think you, if you get a, a debt solution, you either got to jump in as, as fast as you can to pick it up wherever it is um, or stick a stop now just above those highs, um, you know, 42, 15, maybe even 20. You know, if it's trading 20s, then we're, we're probably on for a decent breakthrough. Um, but like you say, I'm, I'm in your camp. I think if you get down to maybe 41s, even a bit lower, um, before this debt resolution happens. I think that's uh, on a risk reward basis. That might be uh, good for, for getting into some longs uh, and see it where it wants to go. Uh, so, yeah, I'm on your side with that one. And so that's that for today, folks. I don't think we've got a lot of data. So Bailey's probably uh, the big show from the central banks. Um, all we've got is the NBA coming up in half an hour. We'll keep a little eye on that for those in the chat room. Um, and as for that, we shall move on to what happens tomorrow. Uh, keep an eye on those headlines for the debt seeding stuff. Um, hope you have a great day. Thanks to Stel uh, for all your valued input as well. Um, we may even Thank get a little uh, special guest appearance, I think, from uh, the Wizard of Waves at some point this week. Um, oh, lovely. So that will be, be a little uh, surprise for you. And just to give you an early heads up, uh, it's a bank holiday in the U.S., um, and most of Europe, UK on Monday. Um, so there won't be any shows, Forex, uh, Analytics, uh, Face, um, any of those shows on Monday. Neither will there be a flow show. Just an early heads up for that one, guys and girls. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support of what we're doing here. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up and a retweet if you see the tweets crossing about the show. If you would be so kind, it would be much appreciated. Have a great day. We'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Ryan, for excellent analysis once more. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Likewise. Thanks, mate. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.